that involves informing, educating, involving, activating patients. Patient engagement is not a new concept, but certainly features very prominently right now. It's emphasized in a lot of government policies, organizational strategic plans, and statements, um, et cetera. So in today's presentation, we're going to explore what it means, how one might do it, and what patient engagement achieves. In particular, in the context of arthritis and cancer, which was the focus of our systematic review, we're also going to identify uh, what remains to be done, as this work really was quite exploratory in nature. Uh, before I begin, I thought I would just give everyone a very quick orientation to the kind of research that I do. I was, was already mentioned, a lot of my research focuses on uh, knowledge translation, how that can be enabled, um, as well as integrated knowledge translation. Probably my main focus is on guideline implementation, and in particular, on how that can be uh, enabled, facilitated, enhanced, by including different types of information and resources and tools, guideline impl implementation tools, uh, for both patients and providers that support implementation of the guidelines. And, and that, in part, is what spurs my interest in these patient-mediated strategies. Um, because I have a lot of trouble getting my, my main research funded, I dabble in various other areas to keep my little operation going. And so, as was already mentioned, I, I have a couple of other studies that are either ongoing or recently completed. With a three-year CIHR uh, grant, we've been exploring the world of medical devices, and in particular, higher-risk implantable medical devices. We're really learning a lot of interesting information about the factors that influence um, how those products are used, and in particular, what's done when adverse medical device events arise. But I suppose this, too, leads to some sort of knowledge translation, because in doing that exploration of those influencing factors, we've identified areas where interventions might be useful. And the same thing with the last item that you see on this slide. Uh, with a three-year CBCF grant, we've been exploring how multidisciplinary teamwork influences um, teamwork, but also uh, outcomes like wait times, number of visits to cancer diagnostics assessment programs across the province of Ontario. And that too has identified a number of challenges um, and issues that may warrant some type of knowledge translation intervention. We, we are together for a brief time today, and we may not have a lot of time for questions, so if you're interested in, in more finer details uh, or additional details, you can refer to the publication. This was, the systematic review was published in Implementation Science in 2016. I want to extend uh, recognition and thanks to my co-authors, Franz Legare, Melissa Brower, Fiona Webster, Elizabeth Badley, and Sharon Strauss. Um, they've They've had a lot of patience with this particular study, and I'll explain why. In fact, we started, we, we conceived of this study quite some time ago. In 2009, we started working on the ideas. We were funded in 2010 by CIHR with a knowledge synthesis grant, and then published this protocol in 2011 as we were launching and getting the study underway. And for a variety of reasons, which I won't go into, the study was essentially done, but um, I never got to the point where I did higher level analysis and then, and then published it. And those of you who do systematic reviews know that once the review sits around for more than a year, then you really do need to uh, completely revisit it and, and a lot of the time essentially redo it. What I'm showing you here is the framework that was published in that 2011 protocol. Even at, the, as you can see here, what we had done was, was a fairly um, large background review, including Cochrane systematic reviews of, that had mentioned any type of patient intervention, and compiled this framework of different types of interventions for different purposes to achieve different outcomes in different contexts, and probably um, I was um, quite naive at the time to think that we could really capture all of this 
in a systematic uh, review. And, and that may have been one of the challenges in terms of trying to get it done and out the door, is that in trying to look at all of these factors, um, it was just so challenging to try and summarize that information in any kind of meaningful way. So as I mentioned, when I pulled this out to dust it off and get started with it again, because I very much wanted to, to get this work done and out, and to pursue this whole area of, of patient-mediated interventions, we had to do some re-envisioning, not of the goals, but of the parameters of the study. The goals essentially remained the same. We know that engaging patients in their own care um, can achieve a lot of beneficial outcomes, but it's not always consistently done. Um, and, and systematic reviews like the one, the Cochrane Systematic Review, published by Legare in 2014, show that in order to achieve that, we may need two different kinds of interventions. Interventions aimed at providers to encourage patient engagement and support it, but also interventions aimed at patients. So the focus of the systematic review that we're talking about today is really what are those interventions that can be aimed at patients? You might ask why did we refer to them as patient-mediated strategies? So we can trace this terminology back at least as far, perhaps further, but at least as far as a systematic review that was published by Dave Davis, 1992 in JAMA, where he looked at 50 or so studies of continuing uh, medical education to examine the influence of those interventions on provider, on physician behavior. And what emerged from that study, although they had not set out to look for it, was that in addition to the physician interventions, interventions aimed at patients also appeared to influence physician behavior and, and patient outcomes. Consequently, when that systematic review was updated and published in 1995 by both Oxman and Davis in, in different journals, they used the term patient-mediated, and they defined that as any intervention aimed at changing the performance of providers for, for which information was bought from or given directly to patients. And I highlight those two facets of their definition because what emerged from those reviews and what they've captured in the definition is what we might consider as two different pathways. So we might influence patient outcomes through the provider, but based on information collected from patients that, are, that, is, that is provided to the physician. The other pathway is acting directly on patients and providing them with different information. In those reviews, the interventions aimed at patients were things like patient summaries, education, or counseling initiatives. And I've tried to capture those two pathways in a very simplistic way. So in this review, we're thinking of patient mediated, meaning the patient influences their own outcomes, but in this first pathway as being an external agent of change to influence provider behavior. And the second pathway, again, is patient mediated because the patient is influencing outcomes, but the strategy is directed at the patient and directly to influence patient behavior, which may or may not influence. The, uh, the provider's behavior and hence patient outcome. We can look to, to, to identify what we might consider patient-mediated strategies. We might look to existing taxonomies, and I've highlighted just a couple of them here in this presentation. One of them is the EPOC strategy, uh, taxonomy that you may already be familiar with, of behavior change interventions. Uh, most of them directed to healthcare professionals, but what I did for the purpose of this presentation and in an in ongoing work that we're doing was identify in EPOC where is it mentioned that there are strategies that are directed to patients. So I'll just draw your attention to a few things that are listed here. They refer to patient mediated in the, in the category of strategies aimed at healthcare professionals. And, and here they refer to only one of the previous two pathways that I mentioned, where information is collected from patients and given to providers. And then pa pa interventions that might be directed at patients are, are mentioned 
in other places in the EPOC taxonomy. For example, what they call pa the patient category of interventions includes um, financial incentives or, or disincentives, which we may not necessarily think of as an engagement strategy that involves informing, educating, counseling. We might actually think of that more like um, a way to organize the system of, of healthcare delivery. The EPOC taxonomy refers to patient-oriented uh, interventions, and the examples they give are, are shown here. Mail order pharmacy, patient suggestions or complaint mechanisms, participation in governance. Um, so that's a different way to, to engage patients that, that may not necessarily involve informing, educating, um, including them, and, and motivating them to be involved in their own care. Other aspects of the EPOC taxonomy that may be more in line with, with the vision for patient engagement includes self-management, discharge planning, patient-initiated appointments, and shared decision-making. Although there are many, one other example I'll show you is the um, ERIC work. And what they did is compile a number of taxonomies to create an uber taxonomy. And so I'll let you just for a moment peruse the different strategies that are listed here. In some ways, this is a little bit clearer maybe than the EPOC taxonomy in terms of defining a variety of different strategies that can be aimed at patients to inf um, that involve informing educating, activating. There are other bodies of literature that we can look to to uh, try and identify patient-mediated strategies. And so one body of literature that I thought I should mention is the rapidly growing area of what's referred to as patient or person-centered care. And in fact, that um, term was entered into the MEDLINE, the MESH lexicon, as far back as 1995, and they define it as the design of patient care wherein institutional resources and personnel are organized around patients rather than around specialized departments. I think this refers to, uh, more so to the organizing of healthcare delivery, the system of care, perhaps rather than informing, educating, involving. Systematic reviews like the Rathurst 2015 review and other literature on patient or person-centered care really does not, um, as far as I can tell, include a standard definition or a taxonomy of what we might consider to be patient-mediated interventions. The bullet list that's shown here in this slide is um, the list of what is considered patient or person-centered by the Institute of Medicine, and this, this definition is also used by others. But if you look at the list, you can see that maybe the first half of these items reflect informing, educating, involving patients in their own care, whereas the others are more related to the way care is organized um, and delivered in the way that patients access care. And before I, I move on to the actual presentation about the systematic review, I'll just want to mention one more study in this literature on patient or person-centered care. And I, I picked this one because it's a pretty neat study. They included, um, I think, 52 hospitals uh, that were considered high-performing hospitals based on the HCAP survey, so the, patient in, the inpatient experience. Uh, survey, and they examined what did those hospitals do? What was in common across those hospitals that may have contributed to achieving high patient experience? And what they found is, is that certainly those hospitals were involved or, or offered interventions that were based on informing, educating, and patients in their own care. So those examples are highlighted in this first bullet. But something that's notable in this review is that these hospitals also provided a, a variety of different types of interventions and incentives that were aimed at healthcare professionals to support and promote them in engaging uh, patients. And I mentioned that 
because it re-emphasizes the point that I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the Legare Cochrane Systematic Review that showed in order to achieve patient engagement, we, we, need to, we may need two different types of strategies, strategies aimed at patients, strategies aimed at providers. And that's germane to the systematic review because we, we, we look for instances of both of those in our review. So again, the, the objective of our review was to identify and describe effective strategies for patient-mediated knowledge translation. We defined that fairly broadly, strategies that engage patients in their own care. And I'll come back to that when, and elaborate on that a little bit when I talk about the analytic framework for the study. But we were looking for interventions um, that were aimed at patients, but that may also have been aimed at providers to promote or enable them to engage patients. We use standard systematic review methods. Because the literature from the time that we first started doing this back in 2009, 2010, to the time when we picked this up again in, in late 2014, 2015, the literature had exploded. So we really had to put some parameters around this to, to scope it, to make it feasible. And so we chose to focus on what we refer to as clinical encounters. So these were patient-mediated strategies that were provided directly before, during, or upon conclusion of an appointment with a physician. In a, in a typical sort of physician office setting, which may have been in a physician practice in the community, or it might have been in a, in a clinic physician office, where the discussions focused on treatment or management of their condition. And we further put a scope around it by focusing on two conditions, one that might be considered chronic, one might, that might be considered more acute, arthritis and cancer in order to just compare, contrast, to see if there were any differences in the types of interventions that were delivered in those two groups. Um, patients were, uh, based on the uh, PICO framework, we defined eligibility. Patients were 18 years or older. As I mentioned, the intervention to patients had to have been delivered immediately before, during, or upon conclusion of a single visit to a physician, clinician, or other staff. We excluded studies, for example, if the patient had to return repeatedly for some sort of counseling. We were interested in that one-time effort to provide some sort of an intervention to patients in order to inform or educate or activate them. And as mentioned, we also looked for any strategies directed to physicians. Um, comparisons, you can see here the types of studies we were looking for. In this effort, we ruled out qualitative work. We were interested in things like randomized trials, observational studies, um, so that we could see if we could link the interventions to objectively measured uh, outcomes. And outcomes included any outcomes that were reported in those papers, including beneficial um, impacts, uh, but also harm. In terms of our search, we restricted it to Medline, Embase, and Cochrane Library. We didn't expand to other databases like CINAHL, for example, because we were interested in physician encounters for this particular systematic review. We also searched eligible study references. We included studies published from 2005 to 2014, published in English language, and the titles and abstracts were screened in duplicate. We also did duplicate data extraction. Um, for study characteristics, we, we extracted the, the typical types of uh, information like publication date, country, design of the study, number of type of participants. For the intervention characteristics, we uh, referred to the wider criteria to report content delivery, issues related to timing and duration, personnel and participants. We also looked for explicit mention of theory that was used to de design the intervention or evaluate it. And we also looked for interventions that were directed to physicians. For impact, we extracted any information on benefits or harms that were experienced either by patients or uh, the providers or their organizations. And we assessed the quality of randomized controlled trials with the risk of bias Cochrane collaboration tool and the Downs and Black instrument for observational study. I'm hoping that you can uh, see this. I know it's very tiny, 
if you want, if you have a paper uh, beside you or you want to look at it after, you can refer to Table 1. So this is our analytic framework that we compiled from a variety of other sources. For type of engagement, we referred to studies by Carmen Grande and Coulter. And they defined different levels or degrees or extent uh, to which patients can be engaged. And so here you can see the definitions for informing, activating, um, or collaborating. For type of support, we referred to a meta review by Taylor et al. The very uh, large review of systematic reviews that focused on um, uh, not self-assessment, uh, self-management. And this list of different ways to support self-management emerged from the study. So they didn't uh, use this from the outset, but these are what they, um, these, these are the findings of their study. So these were the different ways that self-management was enabled. But when we looked at this list, we thought it was quite applicable to looking at a variety of patient-mediated interventions that might be delivered during um, clinical encounters. And in fact, they seem to fit well into these different categories of levels or types of engagement. And in this table, you can see different uh, examples of definitions that we use to help us label the interventions that we identified in the studies that were eligible in our systematic review. Here's the PRISMA flow diagram. You can see that of more than 1,600 studies, a lot of them were excluded, and we ended up with 16 review, uh, studies that were eligible for our review. Here you can see some of those study characteristics. There were more cancer studies than arthritis studies. Um, most of them across both conditions were randomized controlled trials, and you can see that they were of variable quality. In terms of the interventions, we did not find in those 16 studies any interventions that were aimed at physicians or their organizations to influence use of or to promote use of the patient-mediated intervention or interventions that were in question. Um, the patient interventions were delivered by a variety of different types of individuals. But it's notable, I think, that most of the patient-mediated interventions were delivered either before or upon conclusion of the visit by researchers or health educators and not by physicians during the clinical encounter. And of the 16 studies, one study explicitly cited a theory upon which their intervention was based, and that study used theory of planned behavior and something called the common sense model of illness. So in this slide, we start to look at some of the findings. This particular slide is a reflection of Table 3 in the uh, manuscript. And here you can see that a variety of print and electronic types of interventions uh, were used. Most of them were used to provide patients with information about their condition or the treatment they were about to or were already receiving or information that was provided to patients in order to support uh, decision making. The other thing that is notable about this particular slide is that there are a lot of gaps. So there were a lot of types of engagement, types of support, and types of interventions that were not featured in the studies that we looked at in this systematic review. In this slide, I'm showing you just an excerpt, just a small portion of what you will see in the manuscript in Table 2. You really have to refer to the manuscript to see the entirety of it that doesn't sit well on a slide. In the systematic review, we try to identify what were the characteristics of the patient-mediated interventions that may have influenced outcomes. Now, we were not able to pool the outcomes. They were quite heterogeneous in terms of the study designs and the outcomes they reported. As a way of describing the outcomes, uh, we labeled them. 
So if in the study they achieved a positive outcome, a change, an improvement in all of the measures they reported, we labeled it as a plus, a positive study. If the study achieved at least one or more of the changes or the improvements that it sought out to make, but maybe not all of them, and we labeled it as a plus minus study, like the last one you see here listed in the, in the final row. All of the studies achieved at least one of the outcomes that they set out to modify or improve. And in fact, of the 16 studies, 12 achieved positive results in all of the um, outcomes, the impacts that they were measuring. Four of the 16 studies achieved mixed results. And I picked the examples that I'm showing on this slide only to demonstrate that we, that we did try and look at a number of different factors. So we looked at differences that might have been present based on whether the disease was cancer or arthritis, based on different types of interventions, based on different timing, so after, before, or during the clinical encounter, and different types of engagement and support. But as I mentioned, most of the studies had very positive outcomes, so we were not able to explore uh, any trends in terms of the characteristics of the interventions and whether some of them were more successful than others. No studies assessed patient harm. Of the seven, seven of the 16 studies assessed patient satisfaction with the intervention and all seven of the studies reported that the patients were satisfied with the intervention. Two of the 16 studies assess impact on either uh, clinicians that were involved or their organizations. And I've shown uh, the data from those two studies to show that the outcomes, I guess, were not that favorable. So in the first study that reported a, a clinical impact, you can see that at the outset of the study, the physicians that were involved were fairly keen on providing the print material to patients, but by the end of the intervention, they were less so they said that the information may not have been very relevant for their patients or it couldn't be tailored to individual patients or it took too long to provide them with the information. The second study provided patients with CD-ROM information and a list of websites to which they could go to to find additional information, but that did not seem to reduce the number of visits to the oncologist or time spent with the oncologist compared with the control group. Again, this may be a little bit too small for you to see on a slide. This figure is included in the paper. It lists the range of outcomes that were assessed in the studies that were included in this particular review. Again, because we couldn't look at the data, we didn't find any relationships between the characteristics of the patient-mediated interventions and these outcomes. But you can see more granular detail if you're interested in the outcomes um, in the supplementary file that is included with the manuscript, which shows the study-by-study -study data that were extracted. So just to summarize very briefly some of the key findings, all of the interventions that aid achieved a positive impact on at least one outcome that was measured. Most interventions were single rather than multifaceted, either print or electronic, and most of them either informed or activated patients. And I mentioned this point, single versus multifaceted, because um, probably the most recent and, and, and most robust systematic review that examined this ever-present issue of whether single or multifaceted uh, interventions are needed emphasized that uh, single is, is effective a lot of the time, that multifaceted interventions don't necessarily guarantee a more successful outcome than a single intervention. An output of the study is the conceptual framework, and we might view this systematic review as really an exploratory effort to pilot test our conceptual framework. Um, it was easy to apply, so we were readily able to describe the interventions that were present in the 16 studies using the framework. It may not necessarily recognize more patient-mediated interventions than some of the other taxonomies that are available, like the ERIC or the EPOC list 
Um, but it may do so in perhaps a more granular uh, way. And, and we'll be using this conceptual framework in the future to, to continue evaluating patient-mediated interventions. In fact, I can tell you that I just found out this morning that um, a study, another systematic review that we've um, prepared was just published or is now available in implementation science. And we use the same framework to describe the characteristics of tools that have been included in clinical practice guidelines to support self-management. A number of study limitations must be mentioned. Our search strategy may not have identified all studies, and I looked at that again this morning, and really, truly, we could have done a more robust, a more thorough, systematic review uh, in terms of the search strategy. All of the studies that were included featured really positive results, so that might be a reflection of publication bias for more positive studies of interventions. We did apply very stringent inclusion-exclusion criteria, which resulted in us reviewing only 16 studies. And as a result, we were not able to draw strong conclusions between the characteristics of the interventions um, and the outcome. And in terms of next steps, in, in one of the tables that I showed you, it featured a number of different gaps in the types of interventions that were used. So one could certainly do more systematic reviewing of those particular types of engagement or support or interventions in, in order to uh, try and identify more studies to determine whether and how those types of interventions are successful or not. Um, otherwise, one might look to doing primary research to investigate that. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, few interventions were delivered during the visit by the physician that the patient was visiting. The Cochrane Systematic Review and other studies have emphasized that interventions may be needed to provide support to uh, clinicians in order to help them deliver patient-mediated interventions. So that's certainly another area of ongoing research that may be warranted is to find out more about what types of provider and organizational resources and support are needed to enable patient um, engagement or patient-mediated intervention. And finally, because we reviewed a few studies, we're not able to find a link between the characteristics of the interventions and specific outcomes, then we might apply the same framework in future research across other conditions, across other settings, and certainly um, once more studies become available in order to continue try teasing out which patient-mediated strategies are, are most effective in different types of circumstances. Thank you very much, and here's my email address in case you have any other questions, and I'll leave it now to the moderators to field any questions that might arise. Okay, thank you, Anna, for that uh, presentation. Um, so first thing we're going to do is um, go through each site to see if any of the sites have questions. And uh, if any of our other audience has questions, you can send them in to me via the chat function. Um, so we'll start uh, with Dalhousie. So do we have any questions from Halifax? It's okay. Can you hear us? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Sorry, last time our mic didn't work. Um, so, oh, sorry. Um, okay. So, thanks very much for for your talk, Dr. Gagliardi. Um, you mentioned towards the end in your limitation section that there may have been a publication bias. Um, I was wondering if you and the other investigators looked at if any of the studies you reviewed had protocols registered, because um, I would imagine that since most of the studies you reviewed did report only positive outcomes, um, right. that that might explain some of that effect if there weren't protocols registered. It, that's a great question. Thank you. It's not something we did. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if your hypothesis might have been uh, correct. 
um, something I didn't I mentioned earlier, but not when I was discussing the, uh, the limitations, is that one of those 16 studies employed a theory and that their um, quality assessment was quite mixed. So if I know the 16 studies had unclear or high risk of bias, so they may not necessarily have been um, sort of uh, fully and comprehensively planned out, may not have been registered studies. Is that is that something that you have found in systematic reviews that you might have done that the the, the studies that may not have had high quality were not registered protocols? Um, well, I haven't done too many. I just started my PhD, um, but I, I think that it's some that's definitely I've heard about in the literature. So um, right. yeah. Anyways, thanks for for your thoughts on that. Very relevant point. Okay. Any more questions from Halifax? No, we're good. No, thank okay, you for the presentation. Thanks. Um, okay, so we'll move on to Laval. Any questions from Laval? Hi, yes, there's one question. Okay. Um, so um, thanks for the presentation, Anna. So you, you said in the intervention outcomes that there was no studies that assessed patient harms. And uh, I'm just curious to know maybe what, uh, based on your, your, your knowledge of the literature, what kind of harms might you expect to see or could you want to explore when it comes to patient-centered, these patient-centered interventions? Thank you. Um, we, we were trying to be as rigorous as possible, even though we were only reviewing 16 studies, and Cochrane systematic reviews typically look at set both beneficial and, and not so beneficial outcomes. So we were looking at anything that the studies might have reported where they e evaluated any type of impact on the patient. So we found only the positive outcomes. Um, I'm trying to think very quickly on my feet, although I'm sitting, um, of what type of outcomes might be considered harmful. Um, and one, uh, I, I suppose, could imagine that types of interventions might cause greater anxiety in patients. I think that's true of uh, uh, maybe some types of interventions like decision aids, et cetera, where patients are, are just learning about the implications of their condition and its treatment. In fact, something like that might cause more anxiety rather than reducing anxiety or clarifying the decision uh, for them. That's just one very quick example. Um, I, I'm sure there's many more. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, and how about from Ottawa? No questions here. Thank you for the presentation. Okay. And what about um, from our second McMaster site, PEBC? Any questions from there? No, I'm good. Thank you for the presentation. Okay. And how about from our other McMaster site? Okay, nothing from there. Uh, any questions from Western? Western. Any questions from Winnipeg? Um, make sure to unmute yourself if you're trying to ask a question, everyone. <laughs> um, Edmonton. Any questions from Edmonton? No questions. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Any questions from Toronto site? Okay. Um, so thank you for that presentation. It was great. Um, you mentioned that one of your concerns in your review was that the inclusion exclusion criteria were quite stringent. And I appreciate that when you're doing a review, you always have to um, oftentimes rein in the scope of the review to make it feasible. But I'm just wondering, looking back, mm -hmm. is there any kind of study that you would have like to have included or that maybe going forward you want to look at another body of literature to kind of answer a question that you weren't able to answer when yeah. you So again, as a, as a means of trying to impose some stringent criteria around us, we exclude qualitative studies and I do qualitative work. I'm a big fan of qualitative work. If I were to do this again, I definitely would include qualitative studies some degree that might address the previous question about the patient harms that we might see a lot more um, variability in, in impact on patient and patient reaction if we were to look at more qualitative um, types of studies. 
I would probably go back and um, elaborate on the search strategy in terms of the, uh, the, the terms that we searched with, and I would probably include more conditions as a means of, of doing a bigger study where we had um, a more ample volume of studies to, to, to draw information from. In terms of setting of care, um, we looked at patient-physician interactions. Certainly in the realm of things like family health care teams, there's, there's a wider variety of clinicians and other types of professionals that interact with patients. So one might consider expanding the review in that way. We purposely focus on physicians in order to put a scope on the study. We also focused on discussions that were related to treatment or management. As such, we ruled out discussions that may have been around things like prevention, screening. So those, those are, are just as, as relevant. So any of those parameters could probably be added back in in order to expand the, the scope of the study, the number of, um, the number of uh, studies that were available for review and, and might provide us with maybe a very different picture than what we looked at today in terms of the type, the number and the types and the characteristics of the intervention that have been used. Any more questions from here? Okay, we do have a few um, from our listeners. Um, so the first question that came in was, what is the difference between patient-mediated intervention and counseling intervention? Okay, so I, I, I try in the presentation I tried to talk about what patient-mediated seems to be defined as in the literature and it's probably defined in a, in a variety of different ways and we tried to define it for the purpose of a systematic review as interventions that were uh, delivered to patients in order to inform, activate and engage them in, in their care. Counseling and this is based on, on a systematic review that I did several years ago where we looked at interventions in primary care to promote physical activity, in which counseling featured prom, uh, prominently. It was the, the main intervention apart from giving patients, you know, educational types of pamphlets or, or information mm -hmm. summaries, things like that. Counseling featured prominently, and it too was defined and, and described and implemented in a wide variety of ways based on who provided it, the content of the counseling, uh, how many sessions of counseling were offered, whether it was single or multiple. Um, so it, it too varied in such a wide number of, of parameters. But what that systematic review found that even simple one-time counseling sessions seem to have a, a positive impact, at least in the short term. That doesn't directly answer your question, what's the difference between patient-needed intervention or counseling, um, but probably counseling is something uh, far more interactive than some, it is meant to be far more interactive than some of what in this study were described as patient-mediated interventions. In this study, some of the interventions were simply giving information to the patient. So that's just static um, information, maybe on a print handout, maybe give them a URL and they go off after their appointment and look at a website. Um, so counseling likely involves far more interaction, which may be corresponding more so to the collaborative the third engagement category in the framework that we use for this study. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Um, you reported that nine out of 16 studies had un unclear or high risk of bias, um, but the conceptual framework can be used to plan or evaluate PT intervention. <laughs> so how do you explain this conclusion? 
So I'm, I'm going to interpret the question um, as, as I'm understanding it in that our findings were not conclusive and you know, we would agree with that only 16 studies had high, unclear or high risk of bias. We weren't able to show which types of patient-mediated uh, interventions can be reliably used to generate beneficial outcomes. Um, and so why am I advocating <laughs> that this framework be used? Um, I, I, I guess we're not proposing that we guarantee that this is the right framework to use in, if you're going to be planning a patient-mediated intervention either in for real use or for the purpose of doing uh, research. But one of the outputs was the fact that we had compiled this framework it seemed to do a pretty good job of describing a lot of the strategies um, that, uh, in, in describing the strategies that emerge from the studies. It may be a little more granular um, or provide clearer definitions than some of what are referred to as patient-oriented or patient or patient-mediated or patient-directed strategies and other available taxonomy. So at least it gives us um, perhaps a starting point that others may well build on if they continue to do systematic reviews of patient-mediated type of patient -mediated types of intervention or primary research in this area certainly build on and elaborate on the, uh, the framework, which may involve confirming and expanding on it or may involve modifying it. Okay, great. Um, okay, another question. Um, the focus was in the area of arthritis and cancer. What about other areas of focus, i.e. diabetes, um, cardiovascular health? Would it be beneficial to look at this? This is suggested a scoping review, possibly. Right. Um, I suspect, well, patient-centered patient care, person-centered care, patient engagement is important across the board. It's important in terms of engaging patients in their own care and that extends to any type of um, condition or, or issue. So I guess the simple simple answer is yes. In the in the patient engagement literature, there's also another level of involving patients which is not just in their own care, but in planning and evaluating health care delivery and health systems. So that's more so a involving patients um, not only in evaluating satisfaction experience, but involving them in quality improvement committees, in, in governance boards, et cetera. So there's even another level um, that one can look at, but in our in this particular case that we were talking about today, we really were talking about patients in their own individual care. But certainly the, the answer is yes, this, this is relevant and applicable to all conditions, diseases, and healthcare issues. Um, another one, could you expand on your comments as to whether patient self-management interventions are considered as patient-mediated interventions and whether any interventions in the review involved self-management? And there's a second part to this afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm looking at the slide uh, that shows the different types of interventions in the studies that were included categorized according to our analytic framework. And self-management probably applies, um, it probably applies across all of the categories. So in that self-management meta-review, one of the key findings is that there was a broad spectrum of what was considered self-management, right from a simple information handout, as is included in our informed category of our of our framework, right to very complex, multifaceted uh, types of intervention. So presumably patients need information about their condition, um, lifestyle advice, activity, how, to, how to do the functions, the activities of daily living, so that's part of self-management. The activate interventions are certainly part of self-management, so things like um, patient action plans that they can use to help themselves manage their condition. Uh, psychological strategies, physiological monitoring, 
even the collaborate part. Um, one of the examples in one of the taxonomies that I showed you was, um, I think in the Eric taxonomy, was patients being able to take charge of making their own appointments when um, they have unexpected changes or adverse changes in, in their condition. Um, so that's one way to communicate with providers, which is one of the categories included in, in our analytic framework under Collaborate. So the, 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 again, this framework, the, the different types of support and the different examples of these interventions were derived from that meta review of self-management, but they were certainly relevant and applicable to our analysis of, of what we refer to as patient-mediated strategies in, in our review. Okay. I'm not sure if that answers your question. <laughs> um, there's a second part to that, and then mm -hmm. just a heads up uh, to McMaster. I know you have a question, so we're going to come to you after this question. Uh, can you also comment on the types of study outcome measures that were used to evaluate provider behavior and the validity uh, and reliability of these measures? So there were there was little evaluation of um, interventions. Well, there were there were no interventions directed at providers or organizations. Um, if you mean impact on clinicians, organizations, I'm not sure if you can still see the slide, but I flipped to the slide where we talk about some of the outcomes that were assessed in terms of providers or organizations. Two of the two of the 16 studies um, did so and showed that there was a change in provider attitude about having to deliver the patient-mediated intervention, which was a print handout in one of the studies. So at the outset of the study, they were in favor of it, and by the end of the study, they were less in favor of it. That was one of the two examples. Um, but again, I'm not sure if I'm answering your, your question. You can always, uh, you can always send a follow-up if they want. Okay, so back to McMaster. I understand we have a question there. Oh, okay. They just they chatted it in. Okay. So, did any of the, the studies mm -hmm. report on patient important clinical outcomes? So, I'm not entirely sure what is meant by patient important. Does that mean patient reported? outcomes, in which case the answer is yes. Again, I'm not sure if you can still see the slide, but I flipped to the figure one, and on um, the uh, right-hand box lists all the outcomes. This is a compilation of all the unique outcomes that were assessed in all the different studies. So it includes a large number of patient reported outcomes, but I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical that I'm answering what you mean by patient important outcome. Earlier in the presentation, I referred to the Institute of Medicine framework for what they consider to be um, person-centered, elements of person-centered care. And those were derived based on a lot of interviews with a lot of patients in terms of things they valued in their healthcare experience. And if you recall, half of them were things like access to care, the way care was organized. But the four bullets on the top half of that list were things like being informed, having an opportunity to communicate with the health provider, et cetera. And so I think those may be considered patient important outcomes and are certainly reflected here in this list of outcomes. So they're saying um, when they're talking about patient important clinical outcomes, they're referring to um, improvements in health. I guess patient important improvements in health. Okay, so I'm guessing or that, that 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 may mean in their clinical health, so clinical outcomes. And so if that's the case, there were um, a few studies that looked at those outcomes. So um, uh, not many of them, but here in this list you can see symptom severity and control. So few, it's a relevant point because few of the studies um, measure those clinical outcomes, and a lot of them look at things like satisfaction with the information, acceptability of the information, their own level of knowledge, their comfort with decision making, 
whether they felt ready to communicate with their providers, et cetera. So if, if the intent of the question in terms of patient important clinical outcomes is, is objective changes in health, then few studies did that. Okay, thank you. Well, I think that is all for questions. If anyone has any further questions or follow-up questions, you can send them uh, to Gail, and uh, Gail will forward them on to Dr. Gagliardi. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gagliardi, for the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, and just a reminder to everyone to please send in your evaluations to Gail, and I will send out the link to the online evaluation. Uh, our next session will be on May 12th with Monica Kastner, and that'll be the last one uh, for the summer. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.